Good afternoon, dear guests. I am Dr. Nilufar Aminpour, and I have the honor to invite you to another Provost Roundtable broadcasting from Berlin School of Business and Innovation. The topic that is going to be discussed today is how international higher education will look like in 2030 and what it means for the job market. I have gratefully invited the experts in different fields with different backgrounds and we will enjoy uh, their ideas about the topic that they will share with us. To start, uh, let me go for an introduction to our provost and the academic uh, officer, the higher academic officer at BSBI, Professor uh, Kriakos Kouveliotis, and after that I will ask our guests to introduce themselves. Professor Kriakos Kouveliotis has a PhD in European Integration and International Relations awarded by Newcastle University, whereas he also holds an MA in Diplomacy awarded by Lancaster University, a Certificate in Linguistics awarded by Bangor University, and a BA in English Literature and Linguistics, awarded by Aristotle University of Thessaloniki, Greece. He also has completed two cycles of postdoctorate research, one on decision policy making and one on conflict resolution and crisis management. Professor Kouveliotis has worked in various research groups. He is an accomplished researcher in a variety of disciplines, and in the last 20 years, he has been a provost and taught in many universities and educational organizations globally, among which <coughs> City Unity College, Newcastle University, University of Sunderland, Bury College, University of Indianapolis, Hellenic Air Force War College, and Hellenic Naval War College, to name a few. He is an expert in developing new curricula, program syllabi, and also in building new global educational networks and partnerships, as he has already done with institutions from the United States, UK, France, Italy, Switzerland, Ireland, and also Singapore, India, and Somalia. Professor Kubeliotis has created around 100 new academic programs at all levels, supervised a number of 5,000 dissertations, published 12 books and dozens of original scientific articles. His track record of academic publishing is composed of a variety of papers concerning <coughs> sorry, political, economic and educational issues. He has also served as a scientific advisor to the Minister of Defense, to the Deputy Minister of Development and Competitiveness, and to the General Secretary of Communication and Mass Media of the Greek government. In addition, he was appointed by the Minister of Education as a member in the governing committee of the Hellenic Open University. He also holds various professorships in institutions around the world as Honorary Chancellor and founder of Langford International College in Ireland professor at Unitono University in Rome, and president of Athenian Liberal Studies in Europe and in India. Recently, he received a fellowship in the Royal Society of Arts and created in The Hague his own not-for-profit organization, the Global Degree Foundation. Now I would like to ask our guests to introduce themselves and explain a little bit about their backgrounds. Let's start with Dr. Ben. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Kiriakos, for including me in today's Provost Roundtable discussion. I'm very excited to be here. Uh, my name is Daniel Molnar. I'm the Acting Dean of the Economics and Business Faculty. I'm also a faculty member here at BSBI. A little bit about my background. I have a BA in Psychology and Social Work, an MBA in Finance and Marketing, and a Doctor of Law degree with a specialization in Business Law. <clears throat> Excuse me. My professional background, many moons ago I began my career as a social worker. I worked as a social worker after my bachelor's degree and during my MBA education. After my MBA in Legal Education, I worked in various positions 
in finance and in law and legal positions. I have over 20 years of higher education teaching experience in the United States and here in uh, Germany. The last few years I've been working in higher education administration. One of my responsibilities was and continues uh, to be curricular design and uh, assessment development. Again, thank you for having me here. I look forward to today's conversation and speaking with all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, good afternoon, professor, colleagues. Uh, thank you. Um, it's very nice to be with you all this afternoon. My name is Jeffrey Philpott. I'm the, I am the Vice Provost for Academic Quality and Administration here at BSBI. Uh, I joined BSBI recently in August, the beginning of August 2023. And in my role, I lead key initiatives under the guidance of our Provost. I oversee administrative and academic quality activities at BSBI. I provide consultant uh, consultation and mentoring to students and lecturers for, to enhance their academic and professional skills and performance. During my career, um, I think I'm now celebrating my 30th year in higher education. Um, I have served in several institutions in higher education, mostly in the United States, where I was Dean of Students and Vice President of Student Affairs and International Programs. Um, after I came to Germany, um, I lived in Munich, I had my own business there, and after I sold my business, I, I served as the head of academic quality at a business school in Munich, and eventually as the dean of academics. Um, I really, in the last years, have enjoyed focusing on faculty development, the creation and implementation of academic quality programs, curricular design, strategic partnerships, and of course, on student satisfaction and retention. I have a bachelor's degree um, in psychology, a master's degree in English, and a PhD in higher education administration from Bowling Green in Ohio. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Mahdavi, please. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for inviting me. I'm Mohammad Mahdavi, professor of data science at Givma University of Applied Sciences. I did my bachelor in computer engineering. Then I did my master in artificial intelligence. Uh, then I did my PhD here at TU Berlin on a topic which was named data cleaning. It was part of data science field. And since the beginning of 2021, I'm at Gizma University of Applied Sciences as the professor and leader of the data science program. The main focus of my research is on building systems that use artificial intelligence and machine learning to process heterogeneous data, such as unstructured data using natural language processing. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much. Dr. Anna, please. Hello. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is a pleasure and an honor to be a part of our Leader Provost Roundtable. I am Dr. Anna Maria Rostangan. I hold a PhD degree in Cognitive Linguistics. I defended my PhD back in 2013 in tight collaboration with the University of Fribourg, Switzerland, having been awarded a PhD research grant of excellence from Academic Swiss Caucasus Net. Then later on, I went to the business field and I worked as an HR manager at Porsche Center Yerevan. So I tried to combine my theoretical and academic knowledge. I worked as an assistant professor of English at Yerevan State University, and I have been also a PhD mentor at Swiss School of Business Research. Now I am very happy to be a lecturer at Berlin School of Business and Innovation. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you, Dr. Anna. And now Dr. Kajo, please. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thanks for the invite for this special meeting and uh, must be very fruitful as well. Uh, my name is Kadu Shilabi and uh, I'm a lecturer at uh, BSBI. Uh, I have a PhD in uh, theoretical physics. I'm, a, I'm a, a mathematician that uses mathematics to describe life. And life it is divided to two phenomena. One called man-made phenomena, the other one is called um, uh, a natural phenomena, let's say uh, uh, rain, uh, snowing, uh, aurora borealis. So I have been working on string theory on all these dynamical systems, and then it turns out there is some uh, stagnation somewhere in fundamental science. So since 2017, I joined financial uh, systems or dynamical systems in finance. And since then, I have been teaching um, uh, in the financial world. And uh, thanks for having me. Thank you very much. And now I think that Professor the stage is yours. I guess it's my turn now, OK? Um, thanks very much. I, I think uh, from going back to the past and to all the Provost Roundtable we have done, 
This is one of uh, the few that everybody is so well equipped to discuss what we have and with all this qualification and experience. So I think uh, it's a huge upgrade, which I'm very happy that uh, we're all here. We are going to discuss something that we are all involved, but um, as I said in the past, uh, we also need to be practical. So yes, indeed, we will discuss how international education is going to change and what we expect to see in front of us uh, up to 2030. But because we're teaching students and young people, we need to also reply to their questions what they're going to do professionally, the careers. You know that, um, uh, and, and I think I mentioned this quite a few times, that most of the professions that uh, young kids are going to have to exercise in their lives, they have not been invented yet. And even for ourselves, uh, also listening to you and your different backgrounds and everything, how many times each one of us we have changed careers or we shifted around institutions. Uh, and as you know, if we really want to become real academics, we also need to develop new academic disciplines. In some countries, this is a must as well. Um, now, I will start with you, Mohammed, and I will tell you why I will start with you. What everybody discussing lately, especially in education, but also in the professional life, is the impact of this artificial intelligence that everybody now has discovered, as they also discovered the metaverse, just to connect this to the great TEDx event that will run at the end of next month. And nobody knew or have understood what the metaverse is, uh, because it was just augmented reality with virtual reality, that a combination, but when Mark Zuckerberg gave this magic word, now everything is metaverse. The same thing with artificial intelligence, which with the help of mathematics and the law of uh, potentially quantum physics and everything else, now it's a very hot topic. So, I have drafted uh, some questions for all of you, but, uh, but especially for you, Mohammed, to start with. By the year of 2030, how will artificial intelligence and data science, where you are an expert, will transform higher education methods, the pedagogical methods, and also its delivery. What we should expect to see, for example, before you answer, in BSBI we have developed a robot teacher. We call it a Botsby. It's a real teacher based on artificial intelligence, which will start integrating in our teaching schedule quite soon. So what do we expect? So to understand or imagine what will happen to future of academic uh, things that we have, perhaps we need to look at the past and see what has been done so far to, to imagine the future. When I look at the history of the education system, I see three paradigms, three major paradigms. So the first paradigm is the traditional paradigm. We had it, let's say, until the beginning of this century, 2000. We, we had classrooms that were physical. We had teachers and textbooks as the only resources. We had students who are knowledge collectors. They, they just collect knowledge. If you miss a class, you miss that topic. They, there is no uh, compensation. So the only way that you could assess these students was a written exam. This was the traditional paradigm. And this was until 2000. The second paradigm I call it digital era or internet era. It has started after 2000 and it continued until 2020, let's say first two decades of this century. So in this digital era, in addition to physical classrooms, now we had online and also hybrid classrooms. So the students, now they know that they can use online resources in addition to those offline resources like books and uh, teachers, they can use online resources like search engines, like Google, to search for articles, to go for YouTube channels. There is always a guy on YouTube who teach better than your professor. <laughs> so uh, then they also learn that it is not enough to collect knowledge. They have to also learn how to do it. So they need to gain hands-on skills. And that is why the assessment of this paradigm was mainly coursework. So you cannot evaluate students using exams anymore that much. We have a still exams, but the main coursework that we have these days is project work or something that show and evaluate a student's hands-on skills. And now in the 
in a, from a few years ago, let's say 2020, 2021, we started the third paradigm of education. And I call it the Gen AI era or generative AI mm -hmm. paradigm. So in this paradigm, classroom is not anymore this physical classroom or online or hybrid classroom. A classroom could be your mobile phone, your smart device. So that could be a classroom. Your teacher is not necessarily a teacher that we know. The teacher could be your learning body, your, your chatbot, your generative AI system, something like ChatGPT. It can be there for you 24 seven hours. So you always have access to this private teacher, but a students now they can get personalized content. They do not need to look for general purpose content. They can find the content that is generated for them in the best way for them to learn. And they soon notice that it is not enough to just learn how to do it in addition to the knowledge and learning hands-on skills. Now they need to also meet ultimate job uh, requirements. So you might be good in doing some practical things like coding, like producing reports, but who knows, these things might be obsolete in a few years. You need to gain some new skills that are not necessarily those hands on the skills that you already gained. And the role of teacher here, the professors, will be not anymore guiding a student to find the right content, but guiding them to find the ultimate goals for being educated. It's not any more coding or reporting or these kinds of skills. It might be something that the students cannot see in the first place. And of course, the assessment of this paradigm will be much more complicated. You cannot use exams anymore. You might not be able to use the previous project works anymore. Because again, these skills that the students need to learn are all changed. So producing reports or doing co coding, programming might not be the skills that need to be evaluated. So that's how I see it. So we have three paradigms and we just started the third paradigm, generative AI paradigm, and it is going to change the assessment type, the assessment criteria, and the skills that the students need to uh, learn. Okay, of course, you know, with the overexposure that we are having in information lately, everybody has become an economist, a football trainer, uh, even a strategist, a politician, with uh, whatever that means. Um, but still, and we are full also of fake news. And the thing is, we have artificial intelligence now, but there is a real artificial intelligence, which is to generate intelligence itself. And this is the next challenge. Um, now, Jeffrey, we'll come to you. As you know, our school is also very famous in conducting very successful partnerships and collaborations. So in that area, uh, what do we expect to change or to be different by the year of 2030 in regards to collaborations and academic partnerships? Well, great. Thank you for the question, Professor. Um, I'm happy to answer this question. Throughout my higher education career, I've done a lot of work and really enjoyed working with international partnerships of, you know, in, in its many varieties. I think I first would like to point out something that was written by the American Council on Education, that the world of higher education and knowledge development has always been networked. We've always depended on networking. And this may be evidenced by the printing of the very first book and the global migration of scholars and the widespread sharing of internationality. So I think today international networking is extremely important but unlike businesses and industry where organizations traditionally compete to maximize profit, institutions of higher education must compete and collaborate with one another to improve and maintain their position in the higher ed sector. So I believe that the prognosis for collaboration in the next seven to 10 years is really positive, but I do believe that there are some things that we, challenges that we will face, and I would like to address a couple of, of those right now. The first, I think, is really something that we see every day is ge geopolitical tensions in the world. There's ongoing political tensions that are already creating obstacles for international collaborations, political disputes, trade restrictions, 
and especially war, will hinder the mobility of students and faculty as well as limit, I think, critical academic resources. Unfortunately, this geopolitical tension will continue to have a very negative effect on students as well as other international or institutional rather stakeholders. Right now we see a war raging here in Europe and I think unfortunately we, we don't see an end to this, but this will have a long-term effect at least through the, the year 2030. In the future, institutions that currently work with trusted partners may be restricted from collaborating, which will lead to institutional isolation. And I think this is a real concern. Many casualties are likely, not only the deprived students that won't get this experience, but a society at large that will lose immeasurable talents and unique specialization areas that come from these isolated places, uh, we will miss that um, and it won't be part of the higher education landscape. The second, um, I think, really important particular potential challenge is this idea of privacy compliance and data security amidst this, uh, this time of digitalization. The more we go digital, the more we must focus on creating safe digital environment for collaboration. Um, I enjoyed speaking about this with my colleague, uh, uh, Vice Provost colleague, Dr. Ekaterina Sofanova. She suggested that we, we must know that our, we need to know who those peers are behind the avatars that we see. And I think this is something um, that is relevant. The future, uh, we'll, we will have to work together, I think, to create new regulations and technology to protect the future environment from information manipulation and fraudulent activity. So although there are advances in AI, like Dr. Mohammed has just talked about, uh, you know, the seemingly, the metaverse seems to be seemingly boundless. I think we will also, this will also help us in a lot of ways to break down barriers and facilitate international partnerships in ways that we haven't seen before. But again, the more we go digital, the more we have to focus on creating a safe digital environment for collaboration, knowing who our peers are, and all of these things, I think, center around this issue of trust. Geopolitical problems, uh, th this changes in the technological landscape, really uh, makes partners that have even worked together for a long time have be begin to have trust issues. And I think something we'll have to work together in the next years is to really work to create trust when we develop these partnerships. Okay, that's great. Um, Anna. Your domain is cognitive science and psychology, so I'm going to ask you your views mm -hmm. if these two scientific domains revolutionize somehow higher education and what we should expect by the year of 2030. Thank you very much for this insightful question, dear professor, and taking into account my expertise. So, um, speaking about cognitive science and being an expert also of emotions, I can't do without but speaking about emotions as well. So, at first they were conceived as mere sensations, but later on this viewpoint has been revolutionized by such scientists as Klaus Scherer from the University of Geneva, de Sousa, Le Deux, and many others. And now we have a, a kind of a theory of rationality of emotions. Now, when speaking about cognitive science, my main hypothesis in my dissertation was that cognition is comprised of these emotional and rational minds, which are usually uh, cooperating with one another. They are in a balance, uh, emotions stirring up, and the rational mind endorsing or vetoing certain emotions. So in essence, we are not only rational beings, but also emotional ones. And as Dale Carnegie truly stated, when dealing with people, remember, you're not dealing with creatures of logic, but creatures of emotion. Now, coming back to artificial intelligence, uh, right now I'm very much interested into the field of emotion AI, the way that computers can not only perceive, process, and so-called understand humor in human emotions, but also respond to them in an emotional manner. So here, when we have bots be, um, uh, delivering lectures, later on this emotion AI will be developed in such a way that they also respond empathetically to the needs of the students. So in terms of cognitive science, 
um, we lecturers sometimes try to have an insight into the cognitive abilities of the students because we try to learn about their learning type, whether they have a visual type, auditory, haptic, or how to adjust the materials accordingly. And by 2030, uh, I strongly believe that the AI robots can give us more insights into the cognitive abilities of the students. Besides, we know the success stories of Pepper, Buddy, and also already our Botsby. Uh, who will become not only um, assistants to the lecturer, but also companions, so called for the students. And I want to share with you my experience. I had the chance to study during my school years at Gymnasium Ostdorf in Hamburg. And back then with our uh, classmates, we had some gadgets, they were called Tamagotchis, and we had to take care of them. You ha we had to feed them, we had to give them water. So humans were taking care of the robots. Right now it works vice versa. <laughs> so the robots are taking care of ourselves. <laughs> and I firmly believe that by, by 30, uh, 2030, we will be having a very nice human machine cooperation. Thank you. Okay. Um, from what you mentioned about psychology, I think, I'm not going to say Freud, but maybe we should start read again the works of Althusser and Lacan, mm -hmm. because I think they are very current right now and um, can provide many explanations of what we are discussing now. Dr. Kabur. Yes. I had designed a question to ask you, which I'm yes. going to, to mention anyway. Uh, which is what are the crucial trends that universities need to prioritize in the strategies yes. to remain competitive and relevant in the global education landscape? Yes. You can answer this if you want, but I'm going to answer to ask you something else no, uh, based no on what you said before. Uh, absolutely. Um, and that is in this competitive educational world. Yes. We are edu educators on the one hand, and on the other, all our students and young people, are we going to be, to be observants or participants? Oh. So answer the easy question first and then you can uh, <laughs> comment on that. Ah, okay, very good, very good, thank you. Um, this is how I see education. Education is to prepare humans for the future. This is the most general uh, message of education. And in the, in the past, the, the when the revolution came, when we, we, st we used to use horses and then the car came and then the airplane came, now the horses, people who own the horses, they complain, they say we don't have jobs anymore. Now when the car guys, the, guy, the drivers of the car, they say, ah, okay, you can adapt, you can buy a car and learn. This is what's happening to AI, it's the same. Uh, at the beginning we use rocks and then we use hammers and then we use machines. So people who learn how to use rocks, they don't know how to use hammers and machines, they, they try to ad adapt to the new technologies. So these universities now, at 2020, uh, 2030, we should, in order to survive, in order to compete, we need to focus on two things. We need to focus on the solution and the problems that the solution will create. Mm. For example, let's say we build an airplane, so we we train engineers to build an airplane. In the same time, we will train engineers to be environmentalists, to fix the problems, for example, of yeah, pollution. Train them well because I'm flying tomorrow. Of yeah. pollution, exactly, <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> so if you, we want to survive by 23 or 20, 20, 2040 and 2050, we need to build programs that target both the system and the solution that will create those problems which is AI, for example, we, we, we have no choice. We will have no choice except dealing with AI. So we will train our students to learn how to deal with AI. In the same time, AI will create other problems. So we will need to prepare our students to deal with those problems, the secondary type, because we have a primary type, which is the AI itself. A secondary type is the, solu the problems that will be created by the AI. Now, these students by now, after 10 years, they say, oh, wait a second, we knew. In 2023, I, had, I, I weaponized myself by this knowledge, so even the problems will come after uh, AI will lead and everything, I will be there. So these people, they will have jobs, they will not worry about something called, oh, robot took my place. For example, you can see in shopping malls, uh, we just scan and go home, nobody's working there. Now nurses, uh, doctors who just uh, upload a, uh, application, you can just put the symptoms and you have the whole prescription. Now the doctor will say, how about me? Where do I go? 
Now we need to create or build programs that they will push further for AI. In the same time, they focus as well on the problems will be created by the AI. In this case, we will survive. This is number one. Number two, uh, you're talking about observable and uh, how uh, the observer of the phenomenon is part of the phenomenon or not. For me, I think yes. We are a participant as well. Even we observe our students, but we are part of the phenomenon as well. You know the experiment with the two holes? Yes. And with the neutrons and the... Entang entanglement, yes. yes. Yeah. Uh, and just to complement that, um, because you mentioned forces and... Yes. In the beginning of the 20th century in New York, they yeah. decided to... Um, all, all public transportation were made by carriages with horses, okay? Yes. And they introduced the steam cars instead. Yeah. It took them just eight years to change everything. Back then, that was very, very fast. <laughs> and if you translate this to our time, uh, which, to be honest, for what artificial intelligence is going to bring, we don't have a clue. Okay? Yeah. We can make some predictions, but in reality, and I don't think the, the real issue has to do with the change of professions and everything, because we will adapt. Mm -hmm. This is how the human race survived. This is not an issue. The issue is we teach students and we teach young people. We need also to, to think more and, and to provide uh, the soft skills and the necessary skills, and now we'll turn to Daniel, that uh, are necessary for them to be more equipped to go out in the job market, mm -hmm. because this is what most of the families are thinking, the parents, even themselves. Sure. Although for me, if we educate ourselves mainly for us, and as I said in the past also, this is the most personal thing. It doesn't matter how rich you will become, or uh, titles you will get, or, or, or anything like this is for you. So what strategies we can implement, Daniel, and how we can enhance the evaluation of soft skills, critical thinking, adapting of assessment. Mm -hmm. In other words, all this modernization that potentially is necessary in order to equip students more for, the, for go going out to the, to the real world. Right, sure. Thank you for the question, Professor. And, you know, so soft skills, as you probably all know, these characteristics and personality traits, or interpersonal characteristics, that a person has relationships with other people. And you know, attaining soft skills is crucial for our students, right? For several reasons. You know, soft skills complement the uh, technical knowledge acquired by our students during their education process. And most importantly, or very importantly, they're highly valued by employers. Because mm -hmm. it's great to hire someone who has the technical skills or know-how how to do something, like how to make a balance sheet or an income statement, for example. But this doesn't necessarily mean that if someone has these skills, they're gonna be a good leader, right? And so we really need to you know, focus on ensuring that our students have these leadership skills, these soft skills, because um, today's job market demands that, and I imagine that this will continue into 2030 and beyond, right? No matter if we're um, managing people directly in person, whether it's going to be remotely, whether it's going to be in the metaverse or whatever might develop in the future, we still have to have students who have these soft skills, leadership skills. Um, and I think that as the workplace continues to evolve, again, these will be just as important, if not more so in the future. Um, and I think that we can you know, do some different strategies to incorporate uh, working with students on their soft skills uh, during our or with our um, assessments and one thing we could do just in general is clearly defining for our students you know what soft skill criteria um, that they will be assessed on like clearly defining what critical thinking is critically or define what adaptability means or what um, effective communication is so working with assessments we first have to make sure that the students understand clearly you know what a soft skill is and how this is going to be assessed I think also with assessment design, we can bring in real world scenarios, meaning um, what a student can expect um, or they may encounter in future jobs. We can do this by bringing in industry you know, specialists and giving the students like real world sort of problem solving um, activities. 
that includes soft skills, meaning have our students do presentations, give them critical thinking models that they have to compare and contrast, for example, uh, these type of activities that we can gauge their critical thinking and adaptability. You know, giving students a scenario that you were given originally these directions X and you began this project and now all of a sudden your supervisor has come to you and said, we're gonna <coughs> change this because we have a new direction. What would you do in this instance? And you have now one hour to complete this task that you previously have spent two days working on, but now the task has changed. So we can check and gauge students' adaptability because in today's marketplace, you know, things happen at a quick pace and students have to be able to adapt. And we can you know, gauge this you know, through these course designs. I think also um, we can use peer and self-assessment. Uh, a lot of the times we focus our assessment on old school sort of exams or case studies or um, presentations. And we could really look at incorporating maybe some self-assessment, peer assessment to evaluate um, our students' soft skills so students can reflect on their own um, soft skills, what they believe their strengths are, what they believe maybe they can work on. And of course, getting peer feedback is important because what we might think that or perceive as a strength, some others might perceive as a weakness, right? So I might perceive that I'm a direct person. I tell people exactly what's on my mind and my thoughts and other people can perceive this as being aggressive, for example. So peer feedback could be a way that we can um, work on sort of these soft skills. And this is great because what I'm going to ask now you, which is related, it has to do with inclusivity. In this table, in this room, together with our brilliant video production team, <laughs> uh, we are representing around 10 different uh, ethnicities, which is amazing. Absolutely. Absolutely. And in the school, we have 102. Uh, different countries that are represented via us and, and our students. Yeah. So, this inclusivity in higher education across different cultures, like ourselves, yes. um, are these some, do they present some challenges that the universities need to address as well? Because potentially in the near future this is going to grow even more. Today in the uh, in New York, in the United Nations headquarters, um, there is a General Assembly, this annual meeting, with uh, 193 different countries. And I have said that probably one of the targets of BSBI will be, will be to have representatives of all 193 countries that are represented in the, in the UN yeah. General Assembly, and maybe more, because in the Olympic Games, more of them there participate. But anyway, so what measures can universities take to endorse inclusivity? Ah, ah okay, very good, very good. Um, if university or an institution who do not take into account this point of taking everybody in, they will have a disaster. It will be a disastrous case. Why? Because since day one we learned in history that we, we were together in one continent a while ago. And then we went, everybody went different direction, and now everybody is coming back together. So the university must have a program where they open the floor for students to talk to each other. Because we don't know each other, the lack of knowledge lead to misjudgment, to misunderstanding. So I don't know you very well. So it leads to, I say, oh, I don't know you very well means I will judge you. But the more I know you, the more I understand you, the more we take in, we look after each other. So university should open clubs or small organizations, or we call it corners, where students explain, express themselves, uh, advertise about their cultures, where they come from, and, and so on and so forth. Corners, I love it. I will probably add it as a new initiative, and the marketing team will kill me. But I love it. <laughs> corners, okay. So the, the, the more I know about you, the more I will respect you, I will embrace you, the culture, history, philosophy, literature, everything. Because everybody is an ambassador of what they represent. You represent everybody behind, the family, the country, the culture, the language, everything. So the university should have these programs where the students should introduce themselves to tell more about their cultures. So the, the people who do not know 
the other side, they will know more, then they will not misjudge. Then they will not create these things called frictions. As you mentioned before, geopolitical frictions. Yeah. You are from country A, I'm from country B. We don't like each other because something happened thousands of years ago. But now we are in 2023, imagine in 2030 and 40 and 50, that we will all have something called borderless world. Borderless world, who will lead this initiative is the university where they open the floor to students where they listen to each other. That's true. Daniel, I will come back to you. Mm -hmm. um, we mentioned also the curricula and what, uh, what our colleagues say. So this curricula design, uh, what measures must be taken in order to equip students with the necessary skills, apart from the soft skills that we discussed before, mm -hmm. for their future careers? Yeah, I think that, uh, thank you for the question. Um, I think that when looking at curricular design in general, um, I was thinking about sort of the North American approach because the European approach in general and in Germany also specifically the UK, a lot of the times is focused on teaching the subjects just of what you study. For example, here you study business or you study IT and all of your courses normally, you know, 100%, 90% are focused on that particular subject matter. You know, the North American model is a little different, right? There's inclusion of liberal arts courses, you know, psychology courses, sociology, communication. Like general education. Yeah, Greek mythology, whatever it might be, um, that really teaches students how to learn, right? And so learning how to learn, um, studying the classics in Latin like we used to do back, you know, in the old days. And I think that with curriculum design, if we can incorporate, you know, more material that is outside of just the subject matter of business, for example, to provide, and then we, we talked about soft skills, but to provide leadership skills, to, to, to provide other skills in addition to the subject matter of the student's you know, major focus. Um, and that would be, you know, this breadth of knowledge is valuable. And I think that's one thing that is different in um, the European model that we could focus on trying to you know, adapt more. Anna, um, what will be the effect of multilingual communication on the mental and emotional well-being of students in this globalized education system that uh, Daniel also referred? Yes, thank you very much for the question, Professor. Uh, firstly, let us speak about a little bit about globalization. We know in globalization, to put it into simple terms, it's crossing across borders without any restrictions. And when we cross the borders and we have inclusivity as well here, and it's growing and growing, we know that it started out in the 20th century. Some theories say that in the 19th century, some even say that it sparked out in the 60th century when people started uh, sailing for trade. So here, when you go to another country, you have the urge to communicate in the language mm -hmm. of the country. And if you are a multilingual, and being a multilingual myself, I very much appreciate this question. I enjoy speaking and switching between languages. I speak five languages, English, German, Russian, French, and Armenian. And in my country, they say the more languages you know, the more personalities you have. So I'm different when I speak <laughs> in English, I'm sure. different when I speak in French, etc. And uh, as for our students, I sometimes witness that they sometimes experience mental health issues in terms of psychology because they have relocated from another place. And if they don't know the German language, they experience problems with the bureaucracy. So hmm. I ask them to, yeah, <laughs> uh, a usual problem here, but I ask them to learn at least for AI, uh, A1 or A2 levels to, to know the basic um, skills to communicate easily. And for example, as for myself, before we locating here for employment I took the C1 level test so that to be confident myself C1 yeah <laughs> <laughs> so I know when I need a translator when yeah, I go I'll now <laughs> okay that's good very happy we'll be very happy to be a resistance professor and in terms of mentality and psychology you are more confident if you speak the language of the country that you move to and in terms of multilingualism, uh, we know that um, we have two hemispheres. So the uh, right one is responsible for art and creativity. The left one is responsible for logic and mathematics. So as for multilinguals, though some people think that it is not good to learn many languages since early childhood, 
uh, research has shown that these two hemispheres, they collaborate more with one another. They don't function in the brain of a multilingual separately, but there are more synapse connections. So it is a good thing to be a multilingual, in a, especially in a globalized world. I think my left part in mathematics left a little bit <laughs> uneducated, <laughs> but uh, well, okay. <laughs> so, um, uh, Mohammed, I will come back to you. So, what ethical consideration, because ethics is also important, should institutions consider as artificial intelligence and data-driven decision-making become more prevalent in education? Yes, so ethical concerns are always important. If you have watched the... Uh, movie 2001 A Space Odyssey from great Stanley Kubrick, we see that even from several decades ago, people were concerned about A Amazing soundtrack, by the way. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. So, uh, yes, we are shifting a paradigm, as I mentioned, and of course new concerns, especially ethical concerns, will be there, and we need to take care of them. So, one of these concerns, of, of course, data protection. We want to build AI systems, we want to build data science systems, but we need to make sure that data of different stakeholders, like students, like other uh, agencies, are collected and secured uh, there to, to build this system. And we have the right to use this data to build this system. Another important concern is fairness of AI systems that we create. These AI systems are going to automate some of our processes. For example, they are going to automate grading of a student project, or they are going to automate how we proctoring a student in uh, exams. So we need to make sure that these AI systems are also fair. They do not uh, have any bias regarding any gender or any nationality or any ethnics. But the most important ethical concerns that these days people have about AI in academic uh, uh, environment is about assessment. So I, I understand this concern that what if we get a submission from a student and it is produced by AI, or partially by AI. Mm -hmm. I understand this concern. But I personally believe that we cannot look at this paradigm using a standards of the previous paradigm. Again, remember, as I mentioned, the first paradigm was the traditional one. Exams were a standard. Now, the second paradigm was about coursework, when a student can use internet and online materials to, pro pro to provide the project in there. If you wanted to mark the second paradigm submission using your standard, using your mindset from the, pre the first paradigm, traditional paradigm, you wanted to, you probably say, how is it possible? I cannot see my student, he just submitted something. How can I trust him? But that was the standard in past two decades. And now when we look at this new paradigm and we say, how is it possible if somebody uses ChatGPT to produce a submission for me? I cannot accept it. So this is probably because we are, again, looking at this new paradigm using the mindset of the previous one. So in this new paradigm, AI, generative AI, is a reality. We should accept it. There is no uh, way back. We cannot get back. <laughs> Uh, to the way, uh, to the time that we didn't have generative AI. But now what we need to do is to update our assessment type, update our, our assessment criteria to ask a student to do something more high level than producing a report or than producing some code. Um, this is, I'm very happy that you mentioned that and I will explain why. There was an experiment made in Harvard. Mm -hmm. And that explains why Harvard is one of the best universities. So some professors, they actually let their students submit essays, mm -hmm. uh, under their knowledge, of course, um, drafted via artificial intelligence. They did that on purpose. And then they told them, okay, that was a work created by Massini, okay? Now take it, make it better, change it, mm -hmm. intervene. This is exactly, I think, what you meant. Mm -hmm. And this is also what I'm, I'm trying to implement here in, in those lectures that we can to see the other side. Uh, because this is something, as I said, we don't know where it leads. You cannot stop it. Exactly. So we cannot, so if you don't stop it, then you need to love it and potentially to enjoy it. So yes. before we um, end up with the enjoyment part, let's do some ex experiments ourselves exactly. and to see what it leads. Now, that means universities and us needs to adapt. Mm. So, Jeffrey, 
how can universities remain adaptable and resilient among rapid global changes and what is the role of administrators and experienced academics like you? Oh, thank you for the question. I agree with what you and Mohammed have both said. Well, as you know, I have a, a background in higher education administration. And over the years, I have kind of used the word administration synonymously with leadership. So I think what I would like to focus on a little bit is what leaders must do to remain resilient and adaptable. I know when we look at our own successes at BSBI, and I'm new and I'm astounded at how many successes we've had here in a short period of time, we know that this school, and like many others, like you mentioned Harvard and others, are really, uh, they're blessed with really good leadership. I think the X factor in this global change and to do all the things that we've been mentioning must be done in the future really is dependent upon leadership. So, you know, here today, I don't think it's, a, it's, you know, we have you, an expert in higher education internationally. Uh, you're asking these questions today, and I think that this is really um, not something that wasn't given a lot of thought. I think here we are talking about this now, preparing for the future, because we had a leader that demonstrated to us that this is something we need to do. So I think that the future will de depend on leaders doing particular things. Um, th this means um, listening to a variety of stakeholders, students, faculty, uh, industry, recruitment, and our admissions teams to find out what the market is like. So one, I think leaders have to develop strategy for the next years, incorporating a little bit of what Daniel said, a little bit of what Mohammed said, and Anna said, and all of us said, so that we can move forward together. Um, I think we have to do, leaders have to do, uh, develop clear and forward thinking strategic plans. And this would mean that um, they would do this um, in the life cycle of the global changes and the challenges that we have already discussed today. Um, to be, to conduct comprehensive planning, I think the characteristics of the students, of the institution students really have to be taken at heart, to heart, and understood. So we know that leaders must understand the, 20, the students of 2030. Well, they're going to be like their digital natives, let's say. They grew up with smartphones and social media and online learning. They value, they say, diversity and inclusion. They've witnessed global issues like climate change and pandemics and war. And they're entrepreneurial, but also very practical and realistic. We have to keep them in the center of all that we do because this is really the purpose why we're here. Do you remember when, uh, when we were younger and we had something like a new video machine, a new VCR, or uh, even a phone, something that our parents usually ask us to read the prospectus and how fast. Yes. So guess what? We are the old ones now. Yeah, yeah we are. So we are. I want to have a very brief uh, round, and uh, if I ask you to give a phrase as an advice based on your scientific disciplines yeah. and your expertise to all these young people we educate every day, what they can do, what is your advice, uh, and try to remember how we used to be some years ago, for them to be successful in the following years, in one phrase, what you would say? Who wants to start? I, I go first, thank you. One phrase. One phrase, yeah. Uh, don't go back home early. Be always outside. Learn from the others. That's interesting. Uh, you gave me lots of ideas and I didn't yeah. want to comment, <laughs> but tough. I will. They are yeah. saying in some countries, for example, okay, you, there are no so many opportunities, so you go away. Some politicians, they, say, they consider this, they give a phrase, a term, brain drain. I strongly disagree. I think they should push people to go abroad, spend at least some years yeah. or a, a mini career there, adapt to that environment. If they decide to come back, which is their decision, they can only enrich the local environment. If they're not, why to confine them? Okay, Anna? Be open-minded, be creative, be innovative and take risks. Okay, Mohammed? There is no retirement of our generation. <laughs> it's forever <laughs> learning. So we have to learn, always. Or uh, are we going to get a pension? Uh, <laughs> uh, Jeffrey? 
Well, I would say again, I think students have to be at the center of all that we do, but if we are moving to the metaverse, we have to remember that in the metaverse, we met, the metaverse itself won't um, correct bad teaching and bad pedagogy. The, we need good teachers in the metaverse and we have to prepare teachers to be there. Um, and I'm talking right now about living teachers. <laughs> okay. Dinah? Yeah, for students, um, I would say build strong relationships in general, right? I mean, as we know, most of our um, successes are, are built upon strong relationships. Okay. Well, thank you very much. It was very thank productive you. and thank fruitful, you. This, uh, the, this discussion with Hadda. Um, probably we need to repeat uh, this uh, session with um, something different to enrich the process. But uh, I think with all the expertise we managed to bring around this table, I'm very happy and I really enjoyed it. And I hope our audience as well. So thanks for attending and hope to see you soon in another Provost Roundtable.